kick off Thanksgiving, don't you think? Y'all turn around and shake hands with each other before you have a seat and wish somebody a happy, happy Turkey Day. Happy Turkey Day. Y'all are a friendly bunch. All right, have a seat. So about 10 years ago, Thanksgiving was at my house for all the extended family. And I had scrubbed, cleaned, sauteed, chopped everything into an inch of its life. Everything was polished and clean. And I'd even had the kids tell me what they were thankful for for every extended family member. And we had typed it up on cute little scroll paper. And we had tied it with raffia. And the table was set. And it was time for Thanksgiving. And we sat down and we uttered the prayer. And McKenna, who was then about six, my second child, McKenna, who's always been a stickler for detail, she was sitting next to Mike's precious grandmother, Grammy, who at this time was in her late 80s. Now, Grammy always looked like a million bucks. You know the kind of gal, like, even if she had to make a trip to the doctor, she still had her lipstick on. You know what I'm talking about? Had the leaf earrings and the little applique autumn outfit going on. So as we're unrolling the scrolls and the children are saying, oh, Papa, I'm thankful for my Papa because he's such a generous, loving man. And I'm so thankful for Mimi because she's so sweet. And the tears are starting to flow. I see McKenna seated next to Grammy going. And she gets up from the table. And she goes back into the master bathroom. And she comes back with a pair of tweezers and sits down next to Grammy and reaches over to an errant hair on Grammy's chin and goes, toink. I had no contingency plan in my Martha Stewart living Thanksgiving for this kind of event. Have you ever been there? You had a, ever had a Thanksgiving go just a tiny bit awry? Well, we're in good company, folks. It's in the history of the holiday itself. Back in 1609, don't we have this little vision when we get to that first Thanksgiving in 1621 of darling little pilgrims and they've got bleached white starched collars and they're hanging out with these Native Americans and they're just having this big old feast and it's all so cute and quaint and it's like this little village and everybody's got little apple cheeks. Well, the story of the first Thanksgiving began many years previous to that in 1609. In 1609, there was a band of people who called themselves saints or separatists who wanted religious freedom. And so they left Scrooby, England, and they went to Leiden, Holland, where they were able to experience a little bit of religious freedom from King James, who was determined to try to keep both the crown and the church all intact under his power. Well, they did pretty well in Leiden, Holland, and they got a little comfortable with their religious freedom, but... Their leader, William Brewster, he got so comfortable that he began to write a series of scathing articles about King James and the condition of the present-day church. Well, there's a hitch to that. Holland's not all that far from England, and if you tick off the King of England bad enough, he can just put some guys in a ship, send them over to arrest you. So they came to arrest William Brewster, who was able to escape. But it dawns on these saints, these separatists at that time, we might still be a hair too close to jolly old England to really be able to express our faith in the way that we feel called to do so. So they found out about a group called Merchant Adventures who was coming to the New World. And they set off in 1620 in a ship called the... Oh, you guys were listening in third grade, I'm proud. They set off in a ship called the Mayflower. Now, what's also interesting is I always thought that these pilgrims, that we call the pilgrims, these saints, these separatists, like it was like this whole big group that went on the joy bus to the New World. And it wasn't. They were set alongside whom they called the strangers, who were entrepreneurs, who were indentured servants, who were probably a few rogues trying to get out from underneath some kind of a restaurant. There were 27 adult pilgrims. Saints, separatists. There were 43 of the strangers on the Mayflower. And of those 102 passengers who made the voyage, there were 32 children with no travel DVD players and no disposable diapers. As a woman who has crisscrossed the country with a bunch of kids in a 15 passenger van, those numbers have deep significance for me. They finally make it over to the New World in December 1620. Their schedule was way behind. They had never intended to come in the middle of winter. 
They rapidly try to build a few inadequate shelters. Their supplies are dwindling. That first winter that the saints, the separatists, the strangers were on this soil, 45 of them die. 45. Of the 18 adult women who made the voyage, three die that first winter. One more dies in early spring. By the time we actually get to that first Thanksgiving in the autumn of 1621, there are four women left. Four exhausted gals who have been raising their children, other people's children who are now orphaned, trying to support the needs of an entire group of 53. 53 of the original passengers actually make it to that first Thanksgiving. And you know, their stats weren't the only ones that were pretty alarming. The Native Americans who were there at that first Thanksgiving table had experienced as early explorers came from Europe. They had seen in their region of the East Coast 90% of their population wiped out by European diseases. The man we often think of so much when we think of that original Thanksgiving table, Squanto, had actually been taken captive several years previous and had been taken by Spanish monks as a slave back to Europe. He then traveled Europe learning English, and then he came back to what we call the New World to find that his entire family had been wiped out, his entire tribe. But you know, he had something special. He had forgiveness, and he helped those early pilgrims to plant crops, to learn the customs and languages. He acted as an interpreter. When those folks, when those saints and separatists, when those strangers and when those Native Americans make it to that early Thanksgiving table, they're not sitting down saying, what a great year. It's been awesome, hasn't it? They're sitting down to a very somber occasion. They're sitting down to a table where people they thought were going to be with them aren't. They're seated next to people who have different customs and different lifestyles. They're sitting next to people that they have been bonded with in times of deep hardship. You know, it makes me think about when Jonah, in chapter 2, verse 9, says, I will, with a song of thanksgiving, make sacrifice to you. When do you think that was? Once the big fish spit him up? No, it's when he's in the belly of the fish. The forefathers of this country, both pilgrims, saints, separatists, strangers, and Native Americans, did something very important that first Thanksgiving in 1621. They offered a song of Thanksgiving while they were still in the belly of the whale. They had no idea how things would turn out. They were in the midst of loss and illness and warfare. But they took a pause and they said, I will offer a song of Thanksgiving. The Mayflower Society keeps track of different people who came over in the Mayflower. They have been able to document 39 original passengers who came over. They've been able to document their lineage. And of those 39 they can verify, there are now tens of millions of Americans who have a direct descent to those 39 passengers. Tens of millions. Do you think they were sitting around in 1621 going, it's been a little rough, but I've got a vision. There's going to be tens of millions of people in this country in just 400 years. It's going to be great. No. They offered a song of thanksgiving while they were still in the belly of the whale. When you find yourself this Thanksgiving, if it's the perfect Thanksgiving and nobody gets a chin hair plucked, that's good. If you find yourself seated amongst strangers... If you find yourself seated amongst those that there is imminent warfare or illness, would you remember to utter a song of thanksgiving to the Lord? Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the mighty heritage of faith that you founded this country on, both with people who were willing to come for religious freedom, for the Native Americans who were already here who were willing to extend forgiveness, and help those early pilgrims survive. Father, however it goes around our tables this Thanksgiving season, may we always utter a song of thanksgiving to you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Julie Carr, everyone. Amen. <clears throat>